Good morning and welcome to the 2011 Royal Terrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Terrell Museum and its Cooperating Society are proud to present Mr. Jack Sang. Jack is a PhD candidate at the University of Southern California, uh, Los Angeles. Jack was born in Taiwan and grew up in Northern California. Uh, when he when came time to go to university, Jack moved to San Francisco area to pursue a bachelor's degree in integrative biology from uh, the University of California at Berkeley. After completing his undergraduate degree, Jack uh, moved south uh, to pursue a PhD in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. His dissertation research focuses on bone cracking specializations of North American fossil dogs and Eurasian fossil hyenas. Jack is currently living in Edmonton, Alberta uh, with his wife uh, while finishing up his dissertation. Uh, Jack's research interests in, uh, revolve around the study of uh, carnivorans or meat eating mammals uh, he spent one year in Beijing studying fossil carnivores at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology, funded by uh, the prestigious U.S. Uh, Fulbright, Fulbright program. Jack has conducted uh, field work on the Tibetan Plateau, uh, studying vertebrate paleontology of Asian neogene mammals, and has uh, collaborated with researchers on field projects in Southern California, Taiwan, Mexico, and Inner Mongolia. Today, Jack will present an overview of his dissertation research in a talk entitled Tyrants of the Cenozoic, Evolution of Bone-Crushing Hyenas and Dogs. So without further delay, uh, I present to you Mr. but soon to be uh, Dr. Jack Tseng. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Mike, for the very nice introduction. I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about uh, some of my dissertation work. Uh, concentrating on the evolution of bone-cracking predators in the fossil record. And hopefully today I'll try to get everyone on the same page in terms of what we know about modern hyenas, including ones that crush and crack bones, and also about the evolutionary history of bone-cracking predators in general. So just to make sure we're all stepping out in the same step, uh, many of the familiar animals that are uh, familiar to us today, including the ones in the exhibit, are part of the group called vertebrates on the tree of life. And these include birds, mammals, fishes, amphibians, and reptiles. And today, we will leave the dinosaurs behind for now and talk about their relatives, the mammals. And hyenas or, and dogs are, just like us, mammals. However, hyenas, when you hear the word, probably conjures up a lot of stereotypical images about uh, what they are and their behavior. And just based on everything you hear in the media, in the dictionary, or even uh, among pro the professional circle, you might think that they are you know, laughing and really sneaky scavengers. However, uh, as I will try to show you, this is mostly not true. Hyenas actually have quite a complex evolutionary history which complements the diversity of their modern uh, ecology and behavior. So, for starters, the closest living relatives of hyenas are civets and mongooses. And these are medium to small sized mammals that are found today exclusively in the Old World. So, to those of us in North America, we're probably not that familiar with them. However, if you've seen these guys, probably on TV a lot, meerkats, they're the most iconic among this group of mammals. The earliest hyenas probably looked a lot like some of these animals, uh, long-tailed, short-legged, and perhaps with some tree climbing ability. So it is quite remarkable then the descendants of the civet and mongoose-like animals evolved to become some of the most widespread and powerful predators within the past 20 million years, as we will see. Uh, what you should also keep in mind is that hyenas and dogs are not very closely related. Dogs, from your household pet to wolves, jackals, foxes, etc., last shared a common ancestor with hyenas more than 40 million years ago. 
And actually, their anatomical differences are quite clear cut. So we can identify them pretty easily in the fossil record. And this is an important separation to keep in mind as we discuss adaptations that evolve independently in the two groups. Uh, I will not go into a lot of detail about modern dogs or members of the family Canidae, partly because of our general familiarity with them, but also because none of the modern dogs can be considered specialized bone crackers by our definition. However, we will talk a little bit about modern hyenas, which constitute the smallest carnivore family living today. Uh, there are four species in the hyena family. The three larger ones are opportunistic feeders. They're commonly known as the brown, striped, spotted hyenas. And the fourth hyena, the art wolf, is actually uh, an ant specialist. They eat one genus of ants and nothing else. And this is quite a peculiar adaptation for a family known for its carnivory, carnivorous habits. Uh, the brown and striped hyenas are highly omnivorous. And Krakuda Krakuda, the cinematically infamous spotted hyena, is actually quite a proficient predator. And this has been shown since actually the 1960s. One of the earlier studies to demonstrate the hunting ability of spotted hyenas was done in the 60s and 70s by Hans Crook. Uh, he is an African wildlife ecologist. And what he showed was through a seven-year study of hyena populations in Africa, uh, spotted hyenas do hunt as much as lions. And this might come as a surprise to some of you. And this type of phenomenon has been shown in addition to the Ngorogoro and Serengeti populations ever since. So now we know that hyenas, spotted hyenas everywhere do hunt much of their food. Spotted hyenas are also active at night, just like other mammalian predators, and they take advantage of reduced visibility when the prey is more reliant on sound and smell. And perhaps this behavior applies more generally to mammalian predators, as I observe the same type of nighttime activity around my university, uh, where the, the thugs come out at night to attack and mug students. So, if hyenas are such skilled, active predators, what's so different about them that enables them to eat bones? Uh, I will talk about three key skeletal adaptations uh, that we think, collectively, uh, enables modern spotted hyena to consume bone. And first, the first adaptation is their massive jaw musculature. Spotted hyenas have relatively massive heads uh, and the bulk of it contains the powerful jaw muscles they use to crack bones. And this is very interesting because in spotted hyenas, even after individuals have grown past reproductive maturity, they continue to grow in size, at least in their uh, musculature size, presumably to, in order to handle the amount of bone ha they have in their diet. And they do this by using the four major jaw closing muscles in concert to produce very large bite forces. Now, other mammals, including us, have the same type of muscles, but we just have them in different proportions and different weight. And the relative sizes of these muscles can uh, be evidenced from the bone onto which they attach, because muscles require firm bases for attachment on the bone so they can function. And oftentimes, hyenas, bone cracking hyenas, have relatively complex and large surfaces for muscle attachment. And we also see this in other animals in the fossil record, which are indications that these uh, fossil carnivores may also have been bone crackers. A second adaptation is their very massive and robust premolars, which are the teeth between the front canines and the back chewing molars. Mammals in general have what's called heterodont teeth, uh, meaning the dentition or the set of teeth in the mouth are differentiated in both shape and function. Compare this to many of the dinosaurs you see in the exhibits which have less heterodont or even homodont teeth, meaning their teeth are not as differentiated into the different shapes which are used for different things. 
And if you have a dog at home, you probably have observed he or she using the front teeth, these incisors for pulling on things, and the side teeth here, the premolars for cutting or chewing on your fence, your couch, or some other expensive furniture. Uh, in the case of spotted hyenas, these side teeth are used for cracking bone. And this specialization is not only told by its large size, but also by the microscopic structure in those teeth. And enamel, which is the material that covers the surface of mammalian teeth, uh, grows in a layered by layer way, much like layered cake. So in many mammals, many carnivores, uh, the bending pattern of enamel rods, which are the, the microscopic um, building blocks of enamel, are laid down in parallel and horizontal layers. However, in spotted hyenas, the layers crisscross and has become so dense that a zigzag pattern forms in these columns. And when it's uh, magnified to even a higher degree, you'll see the enamel actually sitting at right angles to each other with the points showing the enamel rods that are facing you and the lines showing enamel rods that are facing sideways. And this crisscrossing or zigzag pattern is supposed to give premolars and hyenas a stronger structure with which they can withstand high forces from bone cracking. Now the third adaptation has to do with the internal space on top of the head and the resulting outer shape of their forehead. This is a transparent view of a hyena skull with the brain sitting inside this case right here. And spotted hyenas have a very large frontal sinus cavity, which is uh, the cavity that sits right above the nasal passage here. And this cavity is so large uh, that they actually occupy the space all the way from between the eye sockets all the way to the back of the head. And other researchers have suggested that this cavity is a byproduct of the evolutionary changes in the forehead and hyenas, which evolved to become higher and more rounded over time. Uh, we don't know if this is exactly what went on, but as we will see, some of my own research does seem to support this explanation. Now, this association between a large frontal sinus cavity here and a, a really rounded forehead is not only observed in the spotted hyena, but also in an extinct relative of the hyena family, Dinocrocuda gigantea, the giant terrible hyena, uh, was a Miocene carnivore that's closely related to the hyenas, but actually outside the family. And the skulls here are scaled to their length, but the actual size of this skull was probably around uh, the size of a grizzly bear skull. And this fossil species also had very rounded forehead and a really expanded frontal sinus. And this similarity is even more striking when you compare them to the much smaller frontal sinus cavity in a modern gray wolf. And as we will see later on, uh, these combina this combination of characters actually is correlated with bone cracking ability. Okay, so with these skeletal adaptations, spotted hyenas are able to consume a lot of bone, and here's one demonstration of the bone cracking capability. What you are about to see is a short video clip of a spotted hyena consuming a piece of pig's neck with bones and all, and he will finish his breakfast in under 40 seconds. There we go. Okay, I'll do the sound effects. Crunch, 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 crunch. And as you can see, the white parts are the bone, and the red parts are actually the muscle. So there's mostly bone and little muscle. And they feed this type of thing to uh, captive hyenas in research colonies because uh, they actually prefer to have food with bone in them. Okay, so folks, please don't try this at home. It is probably safe to say 
that spotted hyenas have one of the largest bite force relative to body size of any living predators today. And when you compare it to even a liberal estimate made for the T-Rex, you'll see that the ratios are about three times higher in the hyena relative to the T-Rex. Uh, and this, both of them are still even higher than the ratio between bite force and body weight in the dog. And of course, humans, which have a meager 26 to 1 ratio. Now, a powerful bite combined with skeletal adaptations and this incredible bone cracking behavior are what motivated me to generate the hypothesis that other similar looking carnivores in the fossil record also had this ability. Now, coming up with hypotheses might be the easier part in science because then you have to actually test them. Uh, we don't really have the Jurassic Park technology to genetically engineer these extinct Danokokuda or bone cracking dogs and then videotape them. So I resorted to the next best thing, which is to recreate them in virtual space. Uh, and actually this method isn't as far-fetched as it may sound. Uh, when engineers want to run mechanical tests on something they're designing, whether it be a jet engine, a race car, or some other very expensive component, uh, they don't always have the time and money to build exact replicas, because in some cases they might be entire buildings or bridges that you can't really you know, do a fail test on. So some of the more mathematically oriented engineers came up with a way to approximate the mechanical behavior of real world objects. And one such technique is called finite element analysis. And I'll go through this pretty quickly. There are six critical steps when you want to apply this type of uh, simulation technique to, say, a fossil. First, you need the fossil itself and then a digital copy of it. And we do this by CT scanning, computer tomography, as you would get scanned during a medical exam in a hospital. And the images from the scan, which are like slices of bread, are stacked and then turned into a 3D representation. This 3D representation is then repaired and cleaned because oftentimes fossils are incomplete and there are holes that need to be filled. And this is a lot like plastic surgery. It's very appropriate to train for in LA in case I don't find a paleo job. Okay, and at which point the skull, digital skull, is filled in with 3D, tiny 3D shapes. And at this point, it is now a mathematical representation that can be calculated on a computer. You can then throw properties into the model that make it behave just like living bone or living muscle, and then put in realistic biting and muscle forces into the model. So after a few runs of this very simple procedure, yeah, right, in a few months, you have a couple of digital skulls in front of you that you can actually make to bite things. And again, engineers use this a lot. Here's one example. This is a model of a F1 race car body that was tested using this simulation to identify weak spots in the design. And the color scheme here will be used throughout the rest of the talk. Uh, the red and pink colors represent very high damaging forces, which is not good from an engineering perspective and should be minimized. Blue represents low stress and it's desired. And for those of us from south of the Canadian border, this alternative scheme might make more sense to you. So red means an imminent risk of terrorist attack, which is bad, and blue is good. Now when you apply this technique onto a fossil, what you get, first of all, is a glowing and floating skull. And even though it looks pretty neat, there's actually some science behind it. And this technique does tell us something that we would otherwise be unable to test in the fossil record. This is an animation of a bone cracking dog chewing on a food item. And the red colors you see popping up here are the places where damaging forces might concentrate uh, when a dog was potentially uh, practicing this real behavior tens of millions of years ago. Okay, now to ground truth the effectiveness of this technique, I tested three different skulls. 
the spotted hyena on the right, the living gray wolf on the left, and the extinct grizzly bear-sized Thanokrakuda in the middle. And these colors are again showing where the stresses are popping up uh, when they are assimilated to crack bones. And as you can see, there are more brighter color in the wolf indicating it's not as adapted to bone cracking as these other uh, carnivores. And the curves below are showing the levels of forces that are acting on the skull along the length of the skull. In the wolf, there are actually quite a few number of unpredictable peaks, which means it's not really adapted to handle this type of bone cracking force. Whereas in the modern spotted hyena, and actually this giant thanocrocuda, uh, the curves are smooth and they increase, decrease gradually over the length of the skull. And if you try to locate where these peaks are in the skull, they're actually in the forehead. And this will become important in a few slides. Uh, so the simulations did indicate that Thanokokuda was probably able to crack bones, just like the spotted hyena. And we also have uh, evidence from other fossils that indicate maybe they also have similar predatory behavior. A uh, fossil rhino expert was studying a population of Miocene rhinos from northern China when he noticed that some of the rhinos had heel scars on their skulls and leg bones. So we worked together, we compared all the animals that occur in this fossil assemblage and concluded that this mark was made from the canine bite of a large predator. And in that assemblage, Thanokokuda was the only one that was large enough to have made this mark on the rhino. So this seems to suggest that maybe Thanokokuda not only had the ability to crack large bones, but were also active hunters, just like spotted hyena. So now that we can actually identify bone crackers in the fossil record with this fancy simulation technique, what can it tell us about the evolution of the hyenas or how the bone crackers came to be? Uh, hyenas were not always the mean, lean bone cracking machines they are today. And if you were to walk up to an ancestral hyena 25 million years ago on your vacation to Europe, it would probably look more like a house cat and compare that to the largest hyena uh, that ever lived in the Pleistocene, Pachycrocuda, the robust hyena, standing here next to a coyote-sized wolf. Uh, now, let's see, what else? Now, if just from first glance, you might be able to see the incredible size increase and think that maybe just by being larger, these large hyena species were able to produce the forces necessary for cracking bone without any other type of specialization. However, we do see other living carnivores that are around the same size as spotted hyena that are not able to eat so much bone. So something else had to evolve in the hyenas to enable them to do this. Uh, the shape and distribution of bone in the skull are two major factors. And these are six skulls representing 25 million years of evolution in the hyena family and relative to brain size, which is used uh, to scale these skulls here. You can see that hyena skulls over time were getting wider, thicker, and stronger. And when we run simulations on these skulls, uh, we see that uh, stresses or the unpredictable forces do tend to decrease over time. However, what we did not expect is to see more damaging forces in the forehead region. And actually, this, what this is telling us is that as these hyenas evolved, they're actually dumping more of this damaging force into the forehead. Uh, but after you know, looking at it and thinking about it for a while, uh, it started to make sense a little bit because uh, if uh, damaging forces are necessary, a necessary byproduct of bone cracking, uh, and if there's nowhere else to put it on the skull, you might as well just put it in the forehead because as we saw before, the forehead region is buffered from the rest of the skull by a large frontal sinus cavity. And this means that this region is probably uh, the one, only one that's away from the sensitive organs such as the eyes in the front and the brain in the back. So in fact, 
the forehead was acting like a shock absorber in these simulations. Uh, and this pattern of you know, becoming a shock absorber occurred so gradually that many transitional hyenas actually had a large mixture of features. And evolutionary biologists refer to this phenomenon as mosaic evolution, in which the descendant species uh, that show a wide variety of features that are adaptive uh, acquire those features piecemeal through evolutionary time. And a good example is a fossil hyena from South Africa. This hyena here, Eclo hyena abronia, was around the same size as the African modern African hunting dog. However, its skull shape was more like a spotted hyena. So uh, after we ran simulations with uh, a couple of these different carnivores, we actually found that Eclo hyena had a bite force that was closer to the wild dog, much smaller than a spotted hyena. However, its skull behaved in terms of handling those stresses like shock absorbers, just like the modern hyena. So whereas in the modern South African carnivore community, cats, dogs, and hyenas have entirely different and really distinct hunting and feeding behavior, uh, the ancestral, more ancestral transitional hyena species were not so distinctive. Instead, they were sort of intermediate on the functional scale between cats, uh, dogs, and hyenas. So this is a good example of what we call mosaic evolution. So now we know that all these adaptations that enable modern hyenas to crack bones did not evolve from a single event, a single innovation or smoking gun. Instead, this occurred slowly and gradually over the past 20 million years. Okay, so while all the experimentation with you know, eating bone and adaptation was going on in the hyena world, the true dogs were also up to no good in North America. Uh, this is an interpretation of a bone cracking dog by artist Mark Howlett. Uh, he was trying to recreate what might, ha might have been happening on the North American prairies. And just before we go on, I would like to present my theory that he modeled this dog after my dear ex-governator of California, Arnold, at least a younger version of him, but anyway. Dogs, just like hyenas, had a long evolutionary history of uh, ever-increasing body size. And there are three subfamilies, subgroups within the dog family, that occur sequentially in the fossil record. And the one we're going to concentrate on is the middle subfamily, Borophagenae which is uh, the family that evolved the largest dogs known. And as you can see here, the very first borophaging dogs, or, or actually even more ancestral, the very first dogs were so small that their skull probably would have fitted right into the eye socket of the largest descendants. And the parallel with hyenas is even more striking when you compare uh, the evolution pattern on the genealogical tree. Please don't try to read the words here. Uh, just concentrate on the skull shapes. All three groups of dogs are shown here. Two of them are entirely extinct. The only dogs we have living today are canines, or subfamily caninae. Both agene, bone cracking dogs, are highlighted in orange, and the much smaller hyena family is in blue. And as you can see that both of these groups evolved from house cat sized ancestors into bear sized descendants. And this is even more spectacular if you consider that 99% of the dog and hyena species that ever lived never even saw each other. Both aging dogs were mostly found or only found in North America in the fossil record, whereas fossil hyenas, uh, except for this one species here, which I'll talk about, uh, were for the most part in the old world. And this is quite interesting because hyenas over the past 20 million years were able to spread over land areas that are three to four, even five times the size of North America. But somehow most of them never got there. And that one exception is the North American hyena, Chasma porthides. Uh, this has been called the running hyena and less appropriately the cheetah-like hyena. Uh, they were called that because they have a very long and slender skeleton, 
we probably enable them to run pretty fast, faster than other hyenas. Uh, but they were also thought to have a weaker skull with sharper, more slender teeth uh, compared to modern hyenas. Uh, and a new study that I did with a few colleagues from Spain showed that actually Chasma porthides was just as efficient uh, in bone cracking as spotted hyenas and in both their bite force estimates and the stress or force levels in the skull, as shown here with Chasma porthides in red falling within the range of estimates made for the modern hyena. So the previous interpretation of this hyena being able to make it to North America was because all the other hyenas were too much like dogs or vice versa uh, to be uh, coexisting in the same environment. In other words, that borophaging dogs and hyenas were ecologically equivalents uh, and they excluded each other from their native environment. However, with the demonstration that Chasma porthides was just as efficient as spotted hyenas uh, indicates that there's fewer good reasons now to explain why most of the hyenas never got here. And this remains an open question for some of you small or younger paleontologists to solve. Otherwise, there is a complete parallel series of species over time in the borophaging dog group and the spotted hyenas. And this trend is not new. It has been recognized for decades. But what it is not known is how exactly skull shaped evolve. We're interested in skulls because they're the business end of bone crackers. And if you do a numerical analysis on them using a theory of shape with these uh, landmarks or dots on the skull and tracing how they change in their positions over time, you'll see that here's the genealogical tree of dogs versus hyenas. They actually evolve quite parallel through time. So not only do the terminal specialized bone crackers look alike, uh, the pathways they took to get there were also very parallel. And uh, that's all I will say about it. I won't try to bog you down with the technical details because they even put my co-author to sleep. But I will show you some of the reconstructions and specimens of these hyena-like dogs. Borophagus was the most specialized of all dogs, even though not the largest. Uh, the skulls of these species had very domed foreheads, just like hyenas, very strong teeth that also had those uh, cake-like enamel microstructure, just like hyenas, a very large area for the powerful muscles they use to crack bones, just like hyenas, and they even have an expanded frontal sinus cavity right in, inside the forehead, as seen in the cutaway here. Uh, and these dogs, just based on their skeleton, were definitely capable, as capable as spotted hyenas in cracking bone. Uh, another group, which is a little larger in body size, uh, but not as extremely specialized, are the Alorodon species, shown reconstructed here, chasing down some horses uh, right here in North America. And these dogs uh, have been associated as fossils throughout the US and Canada uh, with uh, horse and camel bones that show uh, extensive signs of chewing and cracking. So there's definitely evidence of them cracking on bones. Uh, what is still controversial is whether these dogs were cooperative hunters or solitary. And there's actually evidence in the skeleton to indicate either explanation, and that is still an open question. Now, if we just use the skulls and again run this type of simulation uh, through the different dog species, we do see that the largest borophaging dogs has skulls that were acting exactly just like the skull of the spotted hyena. They had lower stresses, indicating by the blue colors here, compared to all the other relatives, dog relatives with higher stresses. And they also had really smooth curve of stress. Uh, over the length of the skull. And one interesting thing I will mention is that uh, even though they show this specialization like spotted hyenas, when we try to estimate the size of their muscles, they actually don't seem to be uh, particularly large. So given their body size, uh, they actually have muscles that are expected in those larger animals. 
Uh, so we think that they might have been doing something different in terms of how they use their muscles, their internal wirings of the neurons might be a little different uh, to, in order to generate these large bite forces. Okay, now to sum up really quick, uh, we saw, today we saw a tour of the different uh, bone cracking species and how they evolved. And it, the case of bone crackers is actually quite a spectacular example of convergent evolution where uh, different species that are unrelated evolved to become very similar in their bone cracking capability, perhaps because of a similar environmental or ecological pressure. However, out of all four bone crackers we talked about today, uh, Chasma prothetes, Dinocrocuta, the spotted hyena, and the large borophaging dogs, um, all of them are actually the last remaining members of their lineage. And three of them have already gone extinct along with the rest of their lineage. And this is probably not a coincidence. And an idea that has been proposed to explain this phenomenon in the fossil record is called the macroevolutionary ratchet. Uh, this is just a fancy way of saying these large carnivores lived fast and died young. In other words, the more specialized these carnivores were, uh, the less likely they were to survive in the long run along with their lineage. And this might seem counterintuitive at first. Now, how can these specialized carnivores, including um, other specializations like saber-toothed cats or these hyenas, uh, evolve beneficial features within each species, which actually became detrimental in the long term uh, to their family groups? Uh, the patterns are definitely there across different groups of mammals. However, we do not have a really solid explanation in terms of the process that it actually happens uh, under. And one question that could be asked is whether this same type of observation can be made for specialized dinosaurs or fishes. And this is, again, a big question for all of us to think about. And before we end here, I would like to mention that all of the interpretation about the biology and ecology of the hyenas, dogs, uh, or any other critter for that matter, are reliant on the ground zero discoveries made out there in the field. Oh, well, maybe not today, maybe during the summers. Uh, and um, many of the field paleontologists, including the outstanding ones you have right here in the museum, are making discoveries that continue to change our perception and knowledge of the ancient world. And one field project I have been fortunate enough to be a part of is the expedition to the Himalayan foothills of Tibet. And just this past summer, we discovered a new high elevation megafauna, including the woolly rhino and some of the Ice Age animals, and along with it, a new species of hyena, a uh, new species of Chasmaprothetes, the running hyena. And this is the first time and probably the only occurrence of a hyena uh, surviving in a place that was probably between four to 6,000 meters in elevation uh, at the time of uh, the fauna. And when I was comparing the different teeth of Chasmaprothetes, I also found a few old records of Chasmaprothetes from the Old Crow Basin up in the Yukon Territory. And if that's indeed, if that's indeed Chasmaprothetes, that will represent uh, the northernmost occurrence of hyenas in the world. And together, these two uh, new discoveries and old discoveries are changing our ideas about where hyenas uh, were able to survive and who they survived with. So even though the traditional Ice Age megafauna does not have the hyena in it, I think they should. So I'm just going to put a hyena here. Uh, and with the worldwide range, and now that both high elevation and high latitude occurrence, they were probably able to go anywhere that any mammal could have gone. So that means it's not too long ago, around this very area, uh, you probably had these running hyenas uh, roaming around. Imagine that. Okay, I think I was be a little short on the presentation, but uh, nevertheless, thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention, and I hope we'll continue this discussion with more specific questions. Uh, we actually do see cases of cracked teeth in carnivores, but um,
most of the time they're not on these specialized hyenas. Uh, as you might recall, the specialized microstructure seems to have a, a really advantage of not breaking. Uh, but what we do see, uh, these fractures are actually in dire wolves, in the uh, Rancho La Brea, the tar pits in Los Angeles. We actually have a good record of wolf populations that survive through tough times like a drought or a period of environmental deterioration when those wolves, even though their skulls are not adapted for bone cracking, uh, look like they try to crack bones and therefore crack their teeth a lot. Uh, so, and that's a, that's a good point. Uh, even though you need this specialization, all the skeletal adaptations to, in order to crack a large bone, uh, it doesn't mean that you, they won't do it. They will still try to do it without those adaptations. Uh, and it's less common to see broken zygomatic arches. I think in general, uh, there's probably some nervous system feedback in the animals you know, when they crack a bone. If they can't do it, uh, they won't. They won't try to do it until the point of you know, breaking their, their face. Uh, and you see this in captive hyenas. Uh, the video I showed was from a colony in Berkeley in California. And these hyenas, uh, because they have been living in captivity their whole life, are about half the size of the largest hyena in the wild. So if you give them a bigger bone, like a, a leg of a wildebeest, they will not be able to crack it, and they won't. Uh, yes, I think there is a pattern of increasing thickness in enamel, uh, although I don't think anyone's really documented it. Uh, but uh, when you try to look at the microstructure, you, nowadays it's, it's easier to do it with a light microscope. And it's a lot easier to shine a light through the, the more ancestral species because of the thinner enamel. Uh, in the more derived, the specialized hyenas, it's actually thicker. Uh, so it takes more light to, to get through and see the pattern inside. So I think, yeah, there's definitely a correlation in thickness and ability. Major jaw muscles, those four muscles that I mentioned, uh, are, as far as we know, uh, the only ones they use to crack bones, uh, just based on people's observation. Uh, because when they crack bones, the modern hyenas, the behavior is once they get a piece of it, uh, they will often um, try to put it between the front limbs so it doesn't move and then crack it uh, however which way they want to. Uh, but the neck, oftentimes in spotted hyenas, is thought of as uh, an adaptation for carrying off legs of prey uh, that are otherwise too heavy to carry away and consume by yourself. Uh, because if you also look at the outline of the hy spotted hyena body, they sort of have this uh, lower, more stooped hind legs and really tall forelimbs. And just looking at the evolution through the fossil record, uh, it's probably more likely that it's the lengthening of the forelimb rather than the shortening of the hind limb. And the lengthening of the forelimb has to do with also lengthening the, the neck. So that would make their height, at least in the front, uh, taller. And, and that's what, at least what ecologists have, or behavioral ecologists have used to, to uh, as interpretation of how they carry away prey item. Uh, but I'm not sure if those neck muscles would act together with those jaw muscles in, in bone cracking. I'm not sure. Uh, at least the, the theoretical explanation, I'll uh, talk about that first and then talk about my own explanation. Uh, the theoretical explanation is that uh, they were too specialized to, to really change dramatically in the face of uh, climate change or environmental change. Uh, so they were so specialized in cracking bone and perhaps when there's not uh, a lot of bone to be cracked or consumed, they're at a disadvantage, especially in the dogs, because they actually, uh, this is going into a little more detail, uh, the dogs have modified a somewhat different set of teeth in the mouth. So the hyenas use the front premolars, whereas the dogs use the back premolars. And those back premolars, in all other carnivores, meat-eating carnivores, are crucial for cutting meat. And what the dogs have done is evolve those teeth into a crushing tool without uh, really a good ability to cut muscle anymore. So that might have been a compromise in, okay, now there are no bones, but just meat everywhere. Uh, they're probably less efficient at consuming meat uh, as um, other animals. Uh, and as opposed to my own explanation, I think sometimes species just have, mammal species often have uh, a lifespan. And I think it's, it doesn't really need a special explanation. Sometimes these lineages are around long enough that uh, you see in other lineages, they go extinct. Uh, and I'm not sure that's a satisfactory explanation. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm glad you asked that because I took out two slides 
<laughs> that are also from my thesis about more about the microstructure. Uh, it's a little too confusing, I think. Uh, but uh, what I found out was that the enamel microstructure evolved before all of the skeletal adaptations. And based on the scratches on the surface of the teeth, ancestral hyenas were eating bone before they had the capability to do so in the skull. So you see uh, thickening a little later, but the modifications or the crisscrossing of the enamel microstructure occurred first before anything else. And you see that millions of years before you start to see uh, more robust teeth, uh, thicker skull, uh, a larger frontal sinus. Uh, so again, that's sort of in a mosaic evolutionary way, I, I think, because uh, some things came before. And that makes sense to me because uh, in just the carnivores in general can uh, sort of evolve specialized microstructure in the enamel and then there are descendant species that can lose them. If they don't need to have those, they actually gradually will go back to a sort of flat layer cake-like type. So the teeth seem to be more flexible in terms of how fast they can evolve compared to the rest of the head. Uh, and I find that really interesting. Uh, yes, I think uh, when I compare the biforce and said that the relative to body size, hyenas have a large, much larger biforce compared to T-Rex. Uh, that's probably not totally fair because it would depend on um, what they were eating. And these large dinosaurs, I, I think, without any specialization, if they chose smaller prey, just like mammals, they could eat the bone. Uh, but I don't see any very extreme adaptations in those large dinosaurs to specialize on very large bone. So I don't know if, say, a large theropod would to hunt a triceratops, it would be able to eat the bones. Uh, I don't think you see that kind of scaling that uh, you expect from looking at a mammal and see the types of mechanical re requirements that are needed in a large dinosaur. So I don't think we really see that. Uh, but maybe they function in a different way. So we don't know. We don't know if this is a uh, mammal versus dinosaur thing or it's just very general. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. But I think if I remember correctly, uh, some of the robust uh, hominids uh, don't have the zigzag pattern, but they do have very thick enamel. Uh, so you might have different combinations of you know, how you, you solve the problem of eating something tough. Uh, but that's very interesting. Hyenas also have wrinkles on the surface, uh, especially when you look at a sub-adult or a young adult. Uh, before they crack a lot of bone, you still see very wrinkled surface on the teeth. And, and this is also present in the fossil record, even in the smaller hyenas. Uh, but over time, I think it's scratched very smooth with whatever they were eating. Actually, that's something I have some personal stake in because uh, I've described the occurrence of the Chasma porthides, the North American hyena, from uh, central China a few years ago. And at the time, because uh, it was sort of isolated, there's not really any hyenas around that area, and that's the only one. Uh, so even though it looked a lot like a North American hyena, I referred it to a, an Asian species. And I'm looking at it again, and I'm thinking, uh, I really need to go into more detail to, to really find out exactly when this transition occurred. Uh, because right now, the earliest record of the North American hyena we have, I think it's down in central Mexico, and that's early Pliocene, or, or even at the mild Pliocene transition. So maybe as early as five million years ago, the Chasmapothetes was in North America. Uh, but that central Chinese occurrence may be even, well, maybe around the same time. So it in indicate that if you know, there's hyenas that looked around the same on both sides of the Pacific around five million years ago, uh, yeah, they were the descendants of whatever was in Asia. Uh, but uh, it's also interesting that that genus, Chasman porthides, when they got to North America, became larger and more robust than any of their close relatives in Asia. Uh, and this is in the face of all the other hyena-like dogs running around. Uh, somehow they were able to find, carve out their little niche and survive. So we have them from the Yukon down to Mexico, uh, from California all the way to Florida. Quite a wide distribution for a single, maybe one or two species. Yes, I don't have a good idea. Uh, I've been working with uh, some paleontologists from central Mexico, and we're working on some myopilocene localities, and 
And I told him, well, I really would like to find a hyena further south, you know, into closer to South America. But you know, he said in the 30 years he's worked on neogene mammals, he's never seen a hyena fossil. Uh, but I think the dogs do go down pretty close to, to South America, even though not the bone cracking dogs. I think the modern dogs in South, Af uh, South America are all the, the younger, the most recent subfamily. Uh, so I don't know, the other large mammals were able to, to cross. And that's sort of the same conundrum, I think, as the, the Bering Strait immigration. How come you have all the other animals coming back and forth? Uh, maybe there's some kind of selective barrier. I think that's an idea people have used, uh, but I really don't know enough to really say why. Well, I should cut it off there if we're going to remain on schedule. Uh, so uh, let's thank Jack again. For a great talk. Thank you.